Okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Jean Paul. Uh, I am. Um, mm, thank you for inviting me. Um, I will be trying to give you a short overview of uh, how the Scandinavian uh, archaeologies are uh, implemented in uh, different countries. And I have to stress that I'm not presenting the Danish general opinion. It's my opinion. I'm not representing anyone else but myself, but I have been six years in the Norwegian systems uh, at the university museums, which are, um, which are doing the ex final excavations, uh, and I'll come back to that. I have been uh, many more years, um, probably 15 years in the Danish system, and I'm there now, uh, head of the archaeology, so we are sitting in the middle of things. Um, and, uh, and uh, struggling with the possibilities and limitations of the matter convention, convention how it is implemented. Um, so um, my purpose is it all coming up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my purpose is to compare the rescue archaeology, which I often call it because it's still a matter of rescuing things. Uh, in the Nordic countries in order to evaluate the different models used and the advantages and disadvantages, of course, with the aim of comparing with the rest of, of your experiences. So I will try to play in some of our, uh, some of our experiences, uh, uh, maybe with the hope of influencing a better Melter Convention. Um, uh, this is just a, a graph showing how much was excavated, how many Euros that was excavated for in in, uh, in Sweden, Denmark, and Norway in uh, in 2011, and uh, I could have brought in some more numbers, and it's probably much higher after the crisis, uh, financial crisis, uh, uh, disappeared. But uh, it's just to make it compatible. Generally, it's much more in Sweden, uh, uh, Denmark, and Norway. It's uh, almost the same. Um, there are different reasons for for that. But uh, I'll try and come back to that. Um, but I'll now go through quickly the Danish, uh, the Norwegian, and the Swedish, and the Finnish systems. They're quite different. And then again, they have some similarities. In Denmark, you have two administrative layers. You have the Agency for Culture and Palaces, which not used, used to be called Riksatikvaren, or it's the highest authority referring to the Minister of Culture. So basically, we have, they check the budgets, uh, have to check each budget that we make for excavations, so, they, so there's not a, a mono monopoly situation. And in, in theoretically, uh, in the, the uh, excavation permits are delegated from the National Museum, referring to the Minister of Culture. We do not have private companies, so it's a, what some would call a mono monopoly model. Uh, in the sense that the, the museums, they have, their, they have areas of responsibilities. And here you see some of the areas. I'm here in, in this area, and we have this municipality, this one, and this one. We have three municipalities. Some are bigger, some are smaller. So we have 27. And of course, uh, that's a, a very decentralized uh, system in a small country, and it has its advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, that's why I am. Um, so that was a Danish one, very quickly. Uh, a Norwegian one, and I probably won't do justice to, to it, but I'll have to go through it quickly. Uh, all monuments are protected by default. It's not the case in Denmark. In Denmark, uh, we, we don't have as many protected monuments as in Norway. In Norway, every small pit is protected. Um, they, give, they call it dispensations when they do excavations. We call it uh, generally just uh, uh, excavation uh, project planning, and uh, they have three admin administrative layers. They have the Riksantikvaren, the highest authority. Uh, they have the Fugus Commune, which is the counties. They have 16 of these, uh, and then they have the Archaeological University Museums, where uh, two of which I have been uh, working on in, and they do the final excavations. And they have in Norway, like in Denmark, no private companies. Marine archaeology is handled by marine museums, uh, like in Denmark. Uh, the medieval period in Norway is a bit different from uh, the Danish, because um, it's handled by a research institute called NICO, 
so they have some kind of, uh, it's not competition, they have some kind of delegation, which is uh, more, um, it's, it's not uh, present in the Danish, uh, the Danish uh, situation. And the Swedish, and the reason why I know a bit about the Swedish now is that there has been a political movement for implementing the Swedish model in Denmark. And luckily, if I may say so, it has not succeeded. Uh, but in Sweden, they have three administ administrative layers. They have the Riksantivar, which is the highest authority. They have 21, 21 regional lane spills, which somehow called call counties. Um, and they deal with the bidding and dispensations because everything is also protected in Sweden. They have 27 regional museums, like in Denmark, that excavate, but on top of that, they have 17 private companies. So everything above 100, about 100,000 euro is open for bidding in private companies, unlike Denmark and Norway, where museums and focus commune do the whole, do all the um, all the uh, archaeology in their regions. So here, you could theoretically have a company here, and you can excavate up here if you have the cheapest bidding. Um, and the costs, uh, as you see, were higher. And one more thing, in, in Sweden, the developer also pays for final research reports. So there's a, an extra, I would call, good thing uh, in the Swedish model uh, that uh, uh, that we don't have in the Danish and Norwegian model, where we have to find money for research and final publications uh, from other funding. And the Finnish, I have uh, been in contact with a person who works there. It's not that I know a lot of it, but uh, um, um, I have been, been uh, checking up uh, through email, uh, and uh, and they also all the monu monuments more than 100 years old are protected. The highest authority is the Finnish Heritage Agency. They also give dispensations because everything is protected, so you have to give dispensations. Here you have, an, uh, when an operator is planning, like in the other countries, they have to commission archaeological examinations. But here you have 18 archaeological operators, private companies, and you also, on top of that, have 15 marine private companies. So in many ways, this is the most um, commercialized model in Scandinavia, if you ask me. Um, and they tell me it's often the cheapest bidder that wins. Uh, they have a system for uh, monitoring the quality, uh, but, but they also have uh, a system where all fines and records end up uh, in the same place in the National Museum. Um, so, what they have in common is that developer informs authorities in advance. I guess that's not no that's no news, but you can say uh, there's a difference between when, how early they do it uh, in the different countries. Um, I think in Norway, Sweden, and maybe Finland, it's more formalized, and uh, um, and in Denmark, it varies from different municipalities how good the communication is. In Norway, they also have this. Uh, that the counties that do the trial excavations um, so that you can somehow keep uh, those who assess whether there should be an excavation or not uh, out from those who live from having excavations. So there's not, not this, uh, in theory, this uh, possibility that you find things to keep your company going or, or how you would uh, call it. Um, and the same is the case in Sweden where they have museums, 27 museums. On top of that, those private companies who do both the trial excavations and the final excavations. And as I told you before, uh, in Finland, you have multiple operators. And then we have one. The museum does both the trial excavations and the final excavations. And that's according to district. So there's no competition between the museums uh, or between other actors. This is a case from um, my city where the, we had a, a cemetery which uh, had to be excavated uh, and they were very late in informing us because that's one of the challenges in, so, in some of the Danish systems, decentralized systems, that they somehow forget to inform us. So we have to go and stop them. Here you have a, uh, the same cemetery 
uh, when we came in late, but uh, get got some things out of it anyway. In Denmark, as I told you, the museums make both preliminary and final excavations. In the assessment uh, whether we should have the Swedish model, one of the arguments against it was that it's uh, there's more flexibility having one operator because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of bureaucratic time going from moving it from one operator to another one, and then you have complaints. Uh, and when you have the private bidders and they don't win, like in Sweden, uh, then there are complaints. So there's a lot of time uh, that the developer is um, getting frustrated about. And uh, that's why one of the reasons why the politicians ended up keeping the Danish system where you have one operator, because they're more interested in time than actually money. I'll come back to that. So, but uh, the difference between the Norwegian and the Danish model and the Swedish is that in Denmark and Norway, in theory, the developer does not pay for research, post excavation or research. We have to find it in our own research time. Uh, and it works maybe a bit better in Norway than in Denmark. We have a lot of private uh, funding, but we can do it in Denmark. In Sweden, there's actually money in. Uh, the Malta Convention, they have uh, they have uh, involved it in there in the pro in the uh, uh, rescue excavation um, uh, legis legislation. I'll show you one of the challenges in the Danish system that we have don't have so much protection as in Norway, in Norway, Sweden, and Finland. The protection is higher, but in Denmark, normal agriculture is not protected. And I'm just showing you a plowed over barrel which in, in our district uh, was plowed so low that the Bronze Age swords came up and we had to go and do a trial excavation and see uh, if the grave was there. And we ran out of money so we had to cover it up again and the, the farmer keeps plowing. So I think in Denmark, unlike maybe Sweden and Norway, we have really a chance with the unprotected uh, Monuments that are not uh, that are subdued to uh, agricultural normal ag agricultural activity, um, and as you know, as you may know, Denmark is uh, one of the most uh, intensively cultivated countries in the, in the world. So that is really a, a problem, I think. There's a small part you can uh, you can uh, apply for uh, state in the, from the state, but they didn't find this uh, threatened enough, so. We have to find our own money for, for uh, preserving this work. <coughs> There's another case, and that's why I'm not going to discuss metal detectorists uh, today, but one of the reasons why detectorists in Denmark are, uh, are quite uh, welcome and uh, we have a very good collaboration with them is the case that a lot of things are being plowed up from normal agricultural activity. Here's a gold find, which I was out a few weeks ago excavating where we had uh, metal detectorists helping us uh, going over it. We had a traditional taking off the topsoil in small layers and they were going over it and we, we had uh, much more finds and we could go down and see exactly where the find spot was. Uh, so that's why we really have to involve volunteers, you could call it almost citizen science. Uh, they, we have a good collaboration with all of them. They have a they get, they get money from the state if they report in the fines, and we have a very good uh, uh, track record for that. Most of the people actually do that. We, I, I actually can't think of anyone who doesn't. But there are different attitudes to uh, how it is working in different countries. Uh, in Norway and Finland, it's legal to use detectors, but it's not as normal, probably also because they don't have as much intensity agriculture. Uh, um, land, uh, lots of outland, outfields, where the situation is probably a bit different, less threatening. In Sweden, it is illegal for metal detectorists to go, um, probably also because of the protection, which doesn't make it as necessary. Um, but again, I won't go into that discussion. It's a highly loaded one, but in Denmark, we're pretty post positive. I'm trying to show you this model here, which is one of the um, things that we are also very concerned about in Denmark and which speaks for uh, uh, that having a, a less bureaucratic system where you can switch from pre-excavation to final excavation 
within a day just call, taking, uh, calling off the highest agency and saying this is uh, not getting a, a, a bit, but if you give me it's three more days I can finish it off. Um, and we had a lot of uh, meetings with the stakeholders, the big industrialists, and they kept telling us it's not about the money, it's about time. Yes, they just gotta want us to get out, get get it done and over with and out. And uh, the money, um, of course, you can always find one person who finds it a bit disturbing that there's a a um, a, a fallen bronze age bearers in this field. But the, the the point is, the earlier you get in in the planning, it can point out that there is a bronze age bearer, and it will cost you um, a million Danish kroner, uh, about uh, one and a half. 150,000 euros or something, uh, he can say, no, then I'm going to build somewhere else in my field. But the thing is that sometimes, and some of the worst cases in Denmark, I don't know exactly how it works in Sweden and Norway, we come in quite late, so if we find this project there, it's already too late in the planning process for them to change and build somewhere else. So what we are working with is really to get in much earlier in the process. And I think that's one of the vital things that you have to take back, that the earlier we get in, the earlier we can advise people that here are something that is protected, the better can the spirit of the Melter Convention work, which of course is also about leaving some of the monuments in the ground, not to be excavated. I think that's one of the, the reasons why, as far as I understand it, that the Melter Convention was discussed and uh, and, uh, and implement it in the first place. But I think uh, the earlier we get in, the higher the window of opportunity for the developer to build somewhere else, and we don't have to excavate it. Yeah, that's me stopping something. Uh, so my conclusions, and again, uh, it's my conclusions, it's not the Danish uh, archeological system, uh, it's not the Norwegian system, it's me saying, some of the take-home points from the north. If the spirit of the Malta Convention should work, we must come in early in the planning process. I think uh, they do it better in Norway, Sweden, Finland maybe, than in Denmark. So far, it, in Denmark it varies from municipality, from the museum of the 27th that there are. So we should get better at that in Denmark. Denmark, on the other hand, I think we have a quicker administrative quickness we can go from pre-excavation or trial excavation to final excavation in a few days. I think it's less easy in Norway where you have three or four actors working with different things and maybe also in Sweden where you have uh, several actors where you can do complaints and there will be a process time for the complaints to be, uh, be worked with. Um, and I think, especially in Denmark, we need to secure intensively cultivated agricultural areas better than now. In Denmark, basically, what I, I think in 50 years, there's no archaeology in Denmark to be excavated because it's all being plowed up now. Uh, there will be a few areas. There is an, an initiative in Denmark where we have, through private funding, tried to secure some areas, simply buy the land off the landowner and say, here is a very interesting area for research and protection and there's a big fund and I don't know exactly how it's ending up but uh, a lot of places are being pointed out and maybe a percentage of those will be bought up uh, for protection. In, uh, in Sweden and Norway you have outfields, you have less threatened areas I think so it's, it's not as urgent maybe as in Denmark. We should have money for publications. In, in this case, I think Sweden is doing better than both Norway and Denmark, because in Norway and Denmark, you, uh, you will have to find that money uh, from private funding or from your own institution, which doesn't have funding normally. Uh, also, of course, we must secure high quality and new knowledge better to make better excavation strategies. In Denmark, we have also worked very much with be making this all this archaeology into research, into knowledge, um, instead of just making repetitive, uh, whatever it's called, doing like machine archaeology excavations. Uh, we have to do make new knowledge, and therefore we are working on large. Uh, we are working on on very big uh, 
uh, strategy plans on how can we learn more about this and this and this. Uh, this archaeological feature, this archaeological problem. They do that in many other countries too. Uh, I think in Denmark we are a bit behind. Um, of course we must secure the records and finds for the future. And I think maybe also in Norway, Sweden, and maybe Finland, they're better than that. They have a more centralized system, a bit more money for doing it, and in the decentralized system of Denmark, we're still struggling with having the same kind of result, records, the same kind of GIS systems, the same kind of databases for fines and pictures. So uh, that's the backside of the decentralized system. So, uh, I still think that the so-called monopoly model, where you don't have free companies, is the one that I'll go for. I think they also in Norway think that is the better, the better option. And I don't know if you can ask the Swedes, I don't know, I think those, I know they also say that it's a bit frustrating with all these delaying of time with all the companies, they're making bits and they got complaints and everything is being drawn all over the, over, all over the time. I think maybe, yeah, I can refer you to a few papers. I wrote this one a few, a few years ago, which was uh, an answer to Christian Christiansen's uh, and Monique, uh, um, uh, Monique's uh, the discussion in world archaeology. And what I, what I stressed is, of course, it's about knowledge. It's all about knowledge. It's not about which system. And I'll try to give you some of the Things we should take out, we should take into the new, uh, uh, the new model convention if we come so far, and that I would stress, of course, knowledge and how to get this knowledge accessible, <coughs> how to have it, have it preserved, and how to make it into, uh, yeah, of, of course, uh, better research and understanding of the past. I can also refer to this book, which of course, which uh, unfortunately is in Norwegian. Danish, but it's about the texturists and how we should handle those and that different attitudes in, uh, as I told you, in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. But it's an interesting discussion. And I think maybe that is what I wanted to say. I hope it was not too um, quick, uh, too hasty, but you're of course welcome to uh, come with uh, come with questions. <coughs>